All right, it's 6.30, which is the start time of this class. I'm really glad you're all here tonight. Welcome. I'm, I'm delighted to see all of you. Notice I'm trying to put a spin of hospitality on those words. That's, uh, that's an important thing. Uh, it was pointed out to me that uh, I get up here and start talking without introducing myself, and I just assume since most of the people that are here I know, they know me, but maybe not. So uh, my name is Kim Highfield. I'm one of the pastors here at uh, Coromdale Church. As a matter of fact, I am the newest elder and also the oldest elder, <laughs> which is an interesting thing. I've been married to my wife, Kelly, who's right here, for 40 years. Uh, and we have four kids. Two of them are members here. One of them lives in Clarkston, Washington. One of them lives in Fort Worth, Texas. Our kids range in, range in age from 36 to 26, 10 years uh, gap between number one and number two, um, or number four. Um, <clears throat> my background is that... Uh, I started out at the Air Force Academy after graduating from high school and got kicked out for academic deficiency after a year. Analytic geometry and calculus did me in. So then I decided to become a school teacher. I did that for seven years and then decided I needed something a little less stressful. So I went into federal law enforcement, <laughs> where I was for 20 years, retired from there, in 2004 and then served uh, as a consultant for 10 years after that and uh, then a, a, con a government contractor. What's the, what's the phrase? Uh, Blood-sucking contractor, I think, is the phrase that government workers refer to us as. Um, and retired from that yesterday. <laughs> I'd like to start by opening in prayer. Father, uh, thank you for giving us an opportunity to look at these spiritual disciplines. Help us to take from each one of them things that we can apply in our lives and grow so that we might glorify you in a greater way in all that we think, say, and do. In your name we pray, amen. I'd like to make a book recommendation to start with. The Gospel Comes with a House Key by Rosaria Butterfield. If you buy this book and only read chapter 6, it'll be worth the purchase price. But there's a lot more on hospitality in here, and she refers to the hospitality that she provides to her neighbors and church family as radical, ordinary hospitality. And I am not there yet. And maybe some of you are, but I don't think so. She has 30 or 40 people from the church and her neighborhood over every week for soup and, and uh, bread and conversation, large range of different political, religious, and uh, social views in that group, and sometimes it gets rather tense. She talks about some of that in the book. Um, but the reason that I, I recommend this book, the title, The Gospel Comes with a House Key. Kelly and I moved back to this area after being gone nine and a half years in 1993. And over a period of the first few months that we were back, we noticed that we, we drove by our neighbors and waved, but we never interacted with them. We didn't know much about any of them. So Kelly took it upon herself to um, meet with one of the neighbors, one that lived very close to us, and one the, that uh, probably has lived in her house since the 1930s, and uh, decided that we would come up with something that we call the Ioka Party. Ioka Drive is the name of the street we live on, and there's also an Ioka Way. And so we wanted to bring those two communities together so that we would have an opportunity to get to know each other. So I think the first one we had was in 1994, and we have been doing that every summer 
the Sunday before Labor Day since 1994, we found that communities kind of define themselves. The Ioka Way people do get an invitation, but only a few of them come on a regular basis. The Ioka Drive people show up, show up in force. And the reason I, I tell you about the genesis of the Ioka party is it has also led to a Christmas party for Ioka Drive folks. And... Uh, Another thing that it has led to is exactly what this title says. The gospel comes with a house key. Uh, we have keys to the houses of six of our neighbors now who want us to have access to their house while they're gone, in case they have health problems. Why they picked Kelly and I as the recipients of all these house keys, we're not quite sure, but... Uh, we're more than happy to fill that role and take that responsibility on for them. Also, some of our neighbors have uh, come here for either Easter or Christmas Eve service or both, and uh, none of them have continued to come, but we think that's probably more in the hands of the Lord than it is ours. Just extending the invitation to all of them is what we're required to do. So, the spiritual discipline of hospitality. Where does that definition come from? It comes from the Greek word philoxenia. I had to practice that a lot to get that out correctly. And it means love of strangers or eagerness to show hospitality. And then in Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary, which we love because it, the, the, the definitions are far more re robust than in the more recent dictionaries where you might get the word as the definition explaining the word you're trying to get, and it's very frustrating. So in uh, Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary, it says, hospitality is the act or practice of receiving and entertaining strangers or guests without reward or with kind and generous liberality. So that drew me to 1 Peter 4, 9, which kind of hits on that theme. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Rustin started this spiritual disciplines class off by talking about prayer, the spiritual discipline of prayer, followed by Brandon talking about the spiritual discipline of generosity, and then that was followed by Ryan James teaching on the spiritual discipline of corporate worship. And all three of those spiritual disciplines help in the spiritual discipline of hospitality, and I'll get to more on that later. The text that I'm using tonight comes from Romans 12. I'm using the first two verses, and then verses 9 through 13. Let me read those. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, and seek to show hospitality. The transition from the first 11 chapters of Romans to chapter 12 is significant. We go from 11 chapters about what God has given to us to what we are to give to God. Paul starts by making an appeal to the church by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. 
the rest of chapter 12 from that point on explains how to be a living sacrifice. By the mercies of God establishes the connection between what Paul asked the church to do and what he has told them earlier that God has done for them. The entire letter up to this point demonstrates the mercy of God in action. To do a brief review, here is a list, not exhaustive, of what God has done for us as written in the first 11 chapters. And as Christians, it's good for us to review these regularly because it refreshes our gratitude and renews our desire to give to God what he deserves. We have received grace through Jesus Christ. God has given us eternal life. God gives us glory and honor and peace. God has redeemed us. God does not count our sin against us. God reconciled us to him through Jesus Christ. Jesus died for us when we were ungodly. God has justified us by Jesus' blood and saved us from his wrath. God has saved us from our enslavement to sin. God has adopted us into his family. God foreknew, predestined, and called us. And God's gifts and calling are irrevocable. What Paul calls for is the appropriate and expected response to God's mercy as we have experienced it. He wants to make it very clear that the exhortations that follow are are understood to be a response to chapters 1 through 11. God's mercy exerts a total and all-encompassing claim upon us. Grace now reigns over us. It is entirely fitting that our response is to be one that is equally total and all-encompassing. The presentation of our entire persons as a sacrifice to God. The sacrifice we offer is not some specific form of praise or service, but our bodies themselves. This is not to say that our offerings of praise and service have no value. They do. But it is not only what we can give to God. It is not only what we can give that God demands. He demands us. He demands the giver. In his training on corporate worship... Ryan pointed out that Jewish ritual, the Jewish ritual of sacrifices has ended. It has disappeared. But this is a new form of sacrifice. As living sacrifices, we do not die as we present ourselves, but go on living as sacrifices until we do die. Unlike the sacrifices that have disappeared, there's no... A requirement for us to shed blood. Jesus shed his blood for us and his sacrifice is sufficient. Presenting ourselves as living sacrifices is not done to repent of sins we have committed, but it is done in response to the mercies of God and because our grateful hearts and because of our grateful hearts in response to those mercies. We can present our bodies to the Lord as holy and acceptable sacrifices only if we do not conform to this world but are transformed by the renewing of our minds. This world is the sin-dominated, death-producing realm in which all people included in Adam's fall naturally belong. Paul's command that we not conform to this world calls us to resist the pressure to be squeezed into the mold of this world and the pattern of behavior that typifies it. To be transformed is much deeper and more significant than conformity to the world's pattern. The renewing of our minds is the means by which transformation takes place. 
But just like presenting our bodies as living sacrifices, this is not a one-time event. The renewing of our minds is a continuous process. It doesn't take place overnight, but is a lifelong process by which our way of thinking is to resemble more and more the way God wants us to think. The process of renewing our minds and being transformed by that renewal means we understand and agree with what God wants us to do, and then we put it into practice. In other words, discern and do the will of God. We have the assurance that the Holy Spirit is actively working to affect our renewal in thinking. Paul teaches us to become Christians whose minds are so thoroughly renewed that we know from within almost instinctively what we are to do to please God in any given situation. But how are we transformed? How are our minds renewed? Remember that I said earlier that the spiritual discipline of prayer, generosity, and corporate worship help with the spiritual discipline of hospitality? Here's how they help. In the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question 88 reads, what are the outward means by where, whereby Christ communicates to us the benefits of redemption? And the answer given to that question is, the outward and ordinary means whereby Christ communicates to us the benefits of redemption are his ordinances, especially the word, sacraments, and prayer all of which are made effectual to the elect for salvation. Well, there you are. You've got both prayer and corporate worship in that answer contributing to the spiritual discipline of hospitality. So the spiritual discipline of prayer transforms us as we communicate with God, and he transforms our heart and renews our minds. I have a question for you, and you don't have to answer this one, but I do have other questions coming up that I will ask for uh, audience participation in. Have you ever prayed that God would change someone, and then as you pray, it becomes clear to you that the one who needs to change is you? Prayer often points out that the sin that will undo us is our own, not our neighbors. As we prioritize, prepare, participate, and practice corporate worship, those are Ryan's words, I thought they fit well here, gratitude for the mercies of God is refreshed. As this happens through the spiritual disciplines of prayer and corporate worship, then the spiritual discipline of generosity begins to develop and works hand in hand with the spiritual discipline of hospitality, which is a means by which the spiritual discipline of generosity is practiced. <clears throat> now that we have some understanding of what it means to present our bodies as living sacrifices, let's look at how we live that out in our daily lives. In verse 9, Paul calls for love to be genuine and goes on to explain what genuine love is. Genuine love will abhor what is evil and hold fast to what is good. It's not a directionless emotion or something that can only be felt and not expressed. And so we express genuine love through the spiritual discipline of hospitality. Love isn't genuine when it leads a person to do something evil or to avoid doing what is right as defined by God in his word. Genuine love will lead us to that good which is a result of a transformed heart and a renewed mind. We love one another with brotherly affection. The church should be viewed as an extended family whose members bound together in intimate fellowship should exhibit toward one another a heartfelt and consistent concern. Paul calls on Christians to outdo one another in showing honor. Examples of showing honor would be to recognize and praise one another's accomplishments and to defer to one another 
This too helps with the spiritual discipline of hospitality. And you'll remember in John's sermon on Sunday, maybe, uh, he quoted C.S. Lewis. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, it is thinking of yourself less. So we put others before us. We're concerned about others. We care for others. And we express that through the spiritual discipline of hospitality. That's not the only way, but that is one way to do it. His call for zealousness is related to his previous call. The temptation for any of us to lose steam in our lifelong responsibility to reverence God in every aspect of our lives, to become lazy and complacent in our pursuit of what is good, well-pleasing to God and perfect, is a natural one. But it must be resisted. It is easy to grow weary and neglect the spiritual discipline of hospitality. We may long to be alone. I do. We may long to rest and recharge our batteries. I do. We may long to preserve our cash balances, as meager as they might be. We may long to preserve... Um, we may long to avoid the potential of awkward situations, which can and probably will show up when you practice the spiritual discipline of hospitality. But... When we are zealous in all of the spiritual disciplines, we will find reserves to serve not in ourselves, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. His encouragement to be fervent in spirit might be construed as generating our zealousness by our own fervency of spirit. But Paul's exhortation is to allow the Holy Spirit to set us on fire to open ourselves to the Spirit as he seeks to excite us about the worship to which God has called us. A caution. The encouragement to be set on fire by the Spirit is open to abuse, and we must not fall into that danger. Being set on fire by the Spirit must lead to and be directed by our service to the Lord. It isn't the enthusiasm of self-centered display but the enthusiasm of humble service to the God who has purchased us. Paul then exhorts us to rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. There is a downside to rejoicing in hope, and that is that the path to the culmination of hope is strewn with tribulation. So Paul quickly moves from hope to the need for endurance. But most of us know from experience that to rejoice in hope and to be patient in tribulation is dependent on the degree to which we persist in prayer. Finally, genuine love requires us to contribute to the material needs of the saints who are less well off and to seek to show hospitality. Two ways we can practice the spiritual discipline of ger generosity. We practice the spiritual discipline of generosity by caring for the needs of others and by showing hospitality. All of these spiritual disciplines are integrated together and work together as we move through our lives together. The love of Christians for others is grounded in and enabled by the love of God expressed in the gift of his Son. Refer you back to that list of God's mercies that I read earlier tonight. It's important to point out that we are not talking about the spiritual gift of hospitality. This is the spiritual discipline of hospitality. It doesn't talk about some of you have been gifted with hospitality. It says, seek to show hospitality. It is a discipline. If we think of hospitality as a spiritual gift, we have the easy out of telling others that hospitality isn't my gift. <laughs> but as a spiritual discipline, Paul tells us that seeking to show hospitality is part of presenting our bodies as living sacrifices. 
and, the, and a way of showing genuine love. There is no easy escape for any of us to avoid showing hospitality. It is an important opportunity to serve others with God-given support and supply. Biblically speaking, working from your weakness is often more blessed by God than working from your strengths, which you can often do in the flesh, stealing glory from God. Our greatest opportunity to glorify God comes not from a position of strength, but from a position of weakness. I would contend that biblical hospitality is such a place for many of us. Few of us feel cut out for the work of hospitality because it is extremely sacrificial and costly, even uncomfortable at times. To invite others into your home, to spend an evening with you, is one of the most vulnerable things we can do. But it takes us out of the comfort zone of a night spent with Netflix and launches us into face-to-face -face conversation. It removes the veil of the curated Instagram self and replaces that image with something much more real-time and honest. Hospitality is a way to show genuine love to strangers and guests through opening our homes and, more importantly, our hearts to them. Ryan said in his training on the spiritual discipline of corporate worship that worship should make war against sin and Satan. Hospitality is another form of spiritual warfare. So if you are new to the spiritual discipline of hospitality, you might want to ask the question, where can you start? I would suggest that you can start by introducing you to yourself to someone you don't know or who doesn't know you at church. We get in the habit of greeting and talking to the same people at church every week. Reach out and talk to someone you don't know as well. There are a number of pitfalls here that might keep you from doing so. I've had these conversations with a number of people. Oh, yeah, I went up to this person and I said, so, you new here? How long have you been going? Oh, eight years. Oops. <laughs> Awkward moment. Who cares? <laughs> to assuage your fears, I'll tell you some of the embarrassing things I've done since coming to Coram Dale. My family, the Kanzler family and then the Highfields, sit in the row right by the beam there, and for weeks, for months, there was this delightful woman and her husband behind us, and we would turn around and we'd greet them every Sunday, which was, became very comfortable. But here's the thing. It wasn't until just a couple of months ago that I knew this woman, who was a part of my son's life group. Her name is Lenora, and she's John Needham's sister. I didn't know that. I've been going here for five years, and I didn't know that. I'd said hello to her husband every week for months. Hey, David, how you doing? Shaking his hand. It was only recently that I was told that his name is Rob. <laughs> I'm still alive. I'm up here preaching, teaching on the spiritual discipline of hospitality. It's not going to be a game breaker. People are very, very gracious about this sort of thing. And I'll tell you another story. Delightful family. Jen and Rob DeGrasse. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, you've got that wrong. Yes, and I did for months. Hey, Rob, how you doing? I guess I took Rob's name, gave him David, and then assigned it to Shane De Grasse. I found out that his name was Shane when he was in a membership interview. <laughs> uh, a very awkward, embarrassing moment. Again, I'm still here. I get over it. When you're my age, you're not worried about being embarrassed as much anymore. You just accept it as part of who you are. 
And I'd encourage you guys to take the risk to reach out to somebody. I saw Tim Crawford do that very thing this Sunday. There was a man and his family sitting in the row where the Bouchers are. And during greeting time, Tim went up to him and said, I haven't seen you before. What's your name? And he introduced himself as Cody. Cody has come to Coromdale one week, and then Sunday was his second week, and his family is returning to the church. That is so important for somebody who has been away from the church because of bad experiences or because of their lives, that somebody greets them and says, I'm glad you're here. And Tim Crawford did that. I was very, very proud of him and warned him I was going to use his name tonight in my, my talk. All right. Embarrassment doesn't kill anyone. The next step to ask is to ask someone out for coffee. Ooh. This is a, this is a bit of a, a, a graduation from just greeting somebody and getting to know somebody at church. One other thing I want to say about the greeting part. And Ryan said this. I'm going to repeat it. This is really important. It is really important that you get here early to worship service so that there is time for you to mingle out there and do these things that I've just talked about and stay afterwards to do these things that I've talked about so that you get an opportunity to meet people you don't know. Expand your, your realm of friends. Now you've moved on to the next step and it's to ask someone out for coffee. After church, if your schedule is full, Set up a time, but don't do, don't do what we all like to do. I suspect we all like to do this. Hey, we should get together sometime. Yeah, okay, see ya. <laughs> Let's put some dates down. Let's get some times established. Most of you have smartphones. I can't use this feature on my smartphone because I'm the phone smart, but... Um, <laughs> You can, you can look. You've got calendars in there. You can, you can schedule a time to do it if Sunday after church isn't good. And again, you're in a safe environment. You can, you can make excuses to get away if it gets too awkward or uncomfortable or you hate the people you've asked to go to coffee with you. That may, that's probably a small chance. But you're still in a safe environment. So practice that for a while. Then... Expand it to lunch. And the reason, and again, lunch out. It doesn't have to be expensive. You can go to a fast food restaurant, um, which, which is expensive now, too, I know. <laughs> Inflation. But that's another subject. Um, now, you're, now you're sitting down, you're eating a meal with someone, and eating a meal with someone is, is very, very... It, it, it's transformative in that it opens a lot of eyes. What you want to do is these people who were strangers that you saw occasionally in church, now you're getting together with them, you're discussing things with them, you're telling each other your stories, and you're putting bones and sinews and skin onto the skeleton of this person that you knew. You're giving them substance so that you have you have, a, a, you have a relationship of some sort with them to, to expand and go deeper with. Then the last step of this, the last step is when full hospitality is practiced. And there are a number of excuses that people give to avoid showing hospitality by having someone over for a meal. I'm an introvert. I like to be by myself. Me too. That's not an excuse. And I don't think that's what God wants from us. He wants community. I don't make enough money for hospitality, or I don't know how to cook for large groups, or I am not comfortable entertaining people, or my house is too small, or I live alone, or life is too hectic right now. Here's a story about hospitality, and get ready, because I'm going to ask you questions when I'm done with this. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. 
and, and this is Jesus, by the way, and Jesus went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now the Pharisee who had invited him saw this. He said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is and who is touching him, for, for she is a sinner. Which by implication means he probably didn't think he was a sinner. Dangerous. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which one of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. Okay, so here's the question. Given those three people, Simon the Pharisee, Jesus, and the woman who was a sinner, who showed, how would you rank the hospitality for those three? Anybody? Who, who, who's number one, two, three? Yes, Clara. Yes. Number one is the woman. Very good. Who's number two? Well, okay, let's explore that for a little bit. We've got a disagreement here. Maybe number one was Jesus. Maybe number one was the woman. Who was, who was, uh, can we all agree that number three is the Pharisee? Okay, all right. So, this is not the, the woman's home. So, Clara has said number one is the woman, why would we say that she shows more hospitality in someone else's home than that homeowner showed by inviting Jesus in? Lois? And why, Lois, did she give him so much? Yes, and there's one other thing. She loved Jesus for forgiving her sins. And that is the point of the spiritual discipline of hospitality, to show love to other people, to show your generosity in, because of God's mercies to other people, to show your gratitude for what Jesus has done for you. It doesn't matter what the meal is. I better get back on my, I better get back on my notes here or I'm going to repeat myself. We can sum up the problems with Simon's hospitality with this verse from Proverbs. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fattened ox and hatred with it. So the question, and you don't have to answer this one, is how could God work in the lives of people around you when you say yes to being hospitable? 
I'm going to tell you another story here. It's about a family we've known for years. Our kids were athletes together. They are of a different religion. But they showed hospitality as we got to know each other. It, start, it started, by the way, with a lunch. And that lunch then grew to invitations to each other's houses and talking and debating uh, things in their religion and our religion. And, and uh, their kids would participate in this. One of their kids moved to Texas where she worked for a company who she met some delightful people, and those delightful people invited her to church. She was back home for the Christmas season. We invited the entire family to come to Christmas Eve service. The adults didn't come. Two of the daughters came. One of those daughters returned to Texas, and shortly after that became a Christian. The goal of hospitality, one of the goals of hospitality. You don't do hospitality to pitch the gospel, but you live the spiritual discipline of hospitality. You give your body as a living sacrifice to the spiritual discipline of hospitality, and if God so desires, he'll work in the lives of those you invite into your home and impact them in that way. So I want to end with 14 theses. Thank you, uh, Rustin, for sending these to me. Uh, suggestions, basically, or ideas. I borrowed from uh, Yuri Brito. There, he has a longer name, but I checked today, and he's introduced as Yuri, so I won't try to get the pronunciation of his full name. Um, he is a pastor of Providence Reformed Church in Pensacola, Florida. Number one, the husband is the head of the home. But if husbands invite the guests, we must not impose all the hospitality duties on our wives. Hospitality is a family affair, which means husbands are to be involved and children are to be trained to participate in showing hospitality. If they begin young, they will master it when older. Number two, avoid the urgent to prevent participating in the important. There is a great article online. I just shared it with someone that I, I uh, was talking to. We often let the urgent things in our life crowd out the important things in our lives. And the spiritual discipline of hospitality is an important, transformative thing in our lives. And we should get rid of the urgent if it prevents us from participating in the important. So make hospitality a priority to the point possibly where you even budget for it. Every wife or husband, if he fancies himself a chef, Pete, um, should learn three to five meals that feed larger groups. Number four, this is an important one. Not that the rest of them are unimportant, but I like this one particularly. Hospitality is an opportunity to know others. So engage the people that come over to your house, ask questions, confession, I had a family over, and I was really interested in their story, and it took several hours for them to get it out. And then, then the dad said, well, I feel like I've been interrogated by an NCIS special agent. <laughs> OK, fair enough. But it wasn't to get a confession. It was to, to, uh, <laughs> to get to know them, to, to put that meat on the skeleton so that I understood them more. By the way, awkward moment. In that same conversation, that father broke down and cried. Now, you might think, oh my gosh, what would I ever do if somebody that I invited over for dinner cried? And I, we just interpreted that as a wonderful evening of transparency and openness. It can be a wonderful thing, and, and we found it to be that. Um, so get out of the scene as much as possible. Make room for others to be known. Remember that the intimacy of a home is probably the most social people will ever be. Bring the timid 
into conversations and learn to engage with good questions. I start with this. So tell, tell me your story. Tell me your story and then build on that. Um, this latter will take practice from some, for some, which is why more hospitality is good practice. So you're not good at this? More hospitality. Practice, practice. See yourself getting better. All right, abandon any sense of competition. Sometimes people will say, but my house cannot host this many. Okay, it's not a competition. If you can host two people, then well, uh, host two people. Let it be done with joy and not envy for those who can host 20. The important thing is not the quality or quantity of food, but the heart of the fellowship that is important. It's easy to get into a comfortable hosting rotation of families that, we are, that are just like us, right? So there's no awkward moments, everything's comfortable, normal, it goes along predictably time after time, and that's wonderful and that's good, but also remember the diversity of the church and invite those with different interests, especially the single and widows, into your home. Go ahead and set the rules. If you do, set them early. You're hosting and therefore, you get to set the rules. Uh, I think we have one rule in our house. Well, we probably have more than that. But uh, we, we served in Hawaii for three and a half years, and the dirt there is red, so everybody takes their shoes off when they come into a house. And we've just adopted that habit. And if, you're, if you come over and your socks are holy and you're uncomfortable about it, I'll go put on a pair of my holy socks and come out. And <laughs> we should be comfortable with each other. Um, <clears throat> moms with big families and little ones rarely rest if they are invited somewhere. They're changing diapers, feeding little infants, keeping children from breaking things. If you have a responsible child, assign him or her to some of these duties to give your guests some level of peace. This is especially fruitful if you have young girls or ladies in the home. Number nine, enjoy conversations on every topic. Scary, huh? Literally everything is on the table. Religion, politics, local breweries. But don't be boorish. Sometimes if you're in an uncomfortable situation, you don't like silence, so you fill it with words. You're there to get to know your guests. So make sure you back out, ask questions, listen, enjoy these wonderful people, these image bearers who are with you on that night. Love people. And mom, men, love your wives. Prepare well enough in advance that uh, when your guests arrive, everyone isn't exhausted from the preparations. So the principle here is to know your limits and to plan. Um, and by the way, hosting does not only mean formalized meals. In her book, The Gospel Comes with a House Key, Rosaria points out that Hospi <coughs> excuse me. hospitality is not the same as southern hospitality. And I apologize to those of you who are from the south. My understanding of southern hospitality is it is a way of showing off your nice stuff and, and all that. Well, you're not going to get that if you come to the high fields for a meal because we don't have nice stuff. We've got chip plates and, and uh, glasses, and we don't have enough beer mugs and, or shot glasses, but we make do. And nobody's complained. Um, number 11, hosting does not only mean formalized meals, it can be creative. 
invite someone over for beer and pizza, or snacks in a game night, or you guys are infinitely creative, so you probably have a lot of, a lot of other ideas as well. You can even host a potluck meal so you don't have to cook everything. Hey, we're going to have some folks over. We'd love to have you. Could you bring something? We have a, in our life group, we have a potluck every so often, and we never say, okay, you guys bring salad, you guys bring a main course, you guys bring dessert. We just say, bring whatever you want. We always have plenty of food in all areas, lots left over. It works out fine. Um, so this less formal hospitality is a simple way to have folks over for enjoyable fellowship. Hospitality builds community. I spoke to that earlier. And community is important for corporate worship, generosity, and prayer. The other spiritual disciplines we have covered so far. I suspect that people who don't host are people either ignorant or disobedient to the gospel. Again, this is not a spiritual gift. This is a spiritual discipline that God commands us to practice. Seek to show hospitality. Maybe there are people who have unwarranted fears. I've tried to calm some of those by showing you how awkward and embarrassing we've had it, and we still love to entertain. It doesn't, it, do, it doesn't phase us at all, and you should get to the point where it doesn't phase you at all. There may be somebody you have over, and you go, well, okay, we're not going to have them back ever. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Make sure there's good reasons for that. Uh, those who don't host will often feel left out and may have a tendency to isolate themselves from the community. After a while, this tendency to, will build poor habits in the faith. Hosting reaffirms the centrality of church life. Host. How often? Just host. Some will begin hosting once a month. That's 12 times a year. Some will host weekly or twice a week. Some will host 30 people, others three. Just host. Start picking names. And that's what we do. We sit down every once in a while and go, I'd really like to have X family over. I'd really like to have this family over. And then you start the laborious job of trying to match your dates with their dates. And that's challenging and hard, but don't give up on it. It works out in the end. Um, make hospitality a topic of conversation in the home. Talk about who you would like to have over and make every effort to get them on your calendar. Don't just pay lip service. We'd love to have you over sometime. And then repeat that three months later. Um, so, some closing thoughts. May God... Build our homes and lift our hearts to the joy of the table. May heaven come down every time we open our doors. What makes a meal complete is the sense of sharing and passing and needing oneness in the context of a table, even if that table comes from the meager earnings of a college student or a widow. At that moment, when we are joined, something mystical happens. We are imitating a table of kings and queens. Whether the herbs or the finest meal, the very presence of image bearers partaking of food and drink forms a sacred bond that affirms our love for God and for one another. We don't need abundance. We need only a few grateful saints around a table, sharing stories, and affirming the image-bearing status of one another. For where two or three are gathered around a table, God is in their midst. When Christians practice hospitality, we don't just offer methods. We offer our very selves in order to point people to or remind people of the love of God. Alexander Strock, in his book, Leading with Love writes, Hardly anything is more characteristic of Christian love than hospitality. 
Through the ministry of hospitality, we share the things we value most. Family, home, financial resources, food, privacy, and time. In other words, we share our lives. The the twin commandments of hospitality are to build up the body of Christ and to compel others to taste and see that the Lord is good. Let us love each other. Let us be good stewards of the varied grace of God. And let us show hospitality without grumbling. I end with this verse. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this class on spiritual disciplines. Each one of them is valuable and important. As we interact with each other, grow together, get closer together, overcome obstacles, overcome reservations, and seek to bring you the glory that you deserve. We pray this in the name of your Son. Amen. Okay, it looks like I have four minutes to answer questions, if there are any. Gabe. Oh, <laughs> that, that, that wasn't a question, it was a statement. He, Gabe likes our dining room table. And you know, we bought it with the idea of showing hospitality. It has the, uh, uh, the option of three leaves in it, and it t- we have to move furniture in the living room when it's fully expanded. But we can get more than 10 people around it. It comes with 10 chairs, but we squeeze other smaller chairs in there for young kids and, and that sort of thing. Thank you, Gabe. Anyone else? Melissa. Yes. Not getting overextended with being hospitable. Yes. Well, I don't know if they're good or not, but I can address your question. The question is, how do you uh, how do you measure and set your limits on hospitality without getting overextended? The first thing again that I would return to is this idea of the urgent getting in the way of the important. So what you need to do is you need to to sit down as a family and talk about what are some things that we could give up? What are some things that we can put on hold? so that we can do more hospitality. Now, that was not your question because you you want to hear, how do I limit hospitality? And, And the answer is, it's not a competition. You can, you can set the, you get to, you must set the standards. Okay, for our family, we can have someone over twice a year. We're going to stick with that so that we don't get overextended. That's what we feel we can handle. For our family, we, <clears throat> we host a life group on Mondays and a prayer group Friday mornings at 5.15 a.m. If you're up at that time, feel free to come, men. <laughs> um, you get to set the limits. You know yourself better than anyone else. Feel free to say, we can't do that this, this month. We would love to. We just don't have the bandwidth for it. It's okay. It's okay. And one other thing that I did not really touch on here tonight is that when you are receiving hospitality, that's another important aspect of practicing the discipline of hospitality, being gracious. Rob, being gracious when I called him David. Shane, being gracious when I called him Rob. (laughs) These are opportunities for us to show grace to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Our house is 52 years old, needs a paint job, needs a new deck. 
We can't use part of the deck because it's falling in. And uh, we still have people over. Who cares? It's not about our deck. That's southern hospitality. It's not about our house having a nice new coat of paint on it. It's about the heart that you extend to the people who come over, making them feel honored by being there, making them feel loved by being there, making them feel that the focus was on them and that you're glad they came and you'd love to have them over again at some point in the future with the limits that you set. Is, is that, does that help more? You get to set the limits. You don't have to be obligated because I stood up and talked about the importance of hospitality. Okay, somehow we've got to fit a family in every week, 52 weeks of hosting because that's what God calls us to do. No, just, just seek to show hospitality. Coffee after church. Lunch after church. You're doing it. You're doing it. Because the purpose is to build up the body, right? The purpose is to show others that the Lord is good. Lisa. That's right. Yes. Okay, let me repeat that so it gets on the recording. Uh, Lisa Boucher pointed out that hospitality is practiced, shown outside of your home. You can show hospitality while you're in someone else's home, as did the woman in the story I read from Luke. Nicole? Yes. Sometimes there can be a wisdom aspect of having some strangers into your home that you still want to be able to show hospitality to them. So outside of a home, maybe it's a safer, better environment for their family than bringing them over for a meal. Yeah. If you want to get real risky, you can move a Buddhist into your home for a couple of months. We did that. Well, we thought it went well, but he didn't. <laughs> that is, and here's the thing. We showed hospitality. It didn't work out. We're not responsible for that unless we were jerks, and I don't think we were. Um, the Lord is responsibility for that part of it, is responsible for that part of it. So, yeah. Anything else? Roger. I would say it's worth remembering that the Bible says that the Lord blesses the church, not just the church. Okay, the other church by being what they are doing. Exactly. Okay, that's good. So let me repeat that for the, the recording. Roger points out something that, <clears throat> that I had said, but he said it more, uh, he said it better than I did, which is, it is more blessed to give than receive, and so when you're in someone's house, it is part of your job to show hospitality back. And I talked about talking to people and asking them questions, and, and his point was, it's also important for us to show vulnerability too. I, I mentioned that a father cried. I cried right along with him, right? Mourn with those who mourn. I did. Anyone else? 
All right. Thank you for coming. We're only four minutes and 51 seconds late.